sisters, wherever you may be, I greet you in the, in the name of Jesus, my Savior, my Redeemer, and God, my Father, the universal God who controls all things and the creator himself of this entire universe. With that said, I've come to you once again telling you that God is yet in control. There are many things that are going on in the land today and maybe 
it's causing a certain uh, insecurity about things that are unraveling and happening at this present time. But the uh, being insecure and concerned about the present condition of this world, it's a rightful thing to be concerned about what's going on because uh, you just don't know what's to happen next except that you are, of course, um, reading the word of God and having a valid understanding that we are now living in the time, we're living in the time in the days, as I say every video, that we're living in a time and a day of uh, perilous times. The Bible has spoke about this. God has warned his people, all of us, by the word and through the word of God that we're living in days and times that uh, there are perilous times as the Bible refers to it. But these are times that um, of uncertainties. These are times that causes the mind to be very insecure um, uh, about what is to come the next day and what is to come the next hour. We're yet faced with a, um, a lot of people that are dying uh, daily and there is a greater surge uh, now in the land with this COVID virus. So there are more people that are affected by this disease and, and certainly there are more dying. Even so with all of these things that are happening, I still say and I want to uh, tell you that God is yet in control. These things and things that are coming has already been spoken of. So it, it behooves us, it behooves every one of us that have a right relationship with God, a, a relationship with God that knows him. It behooves every one of us to prepare ourselves, prepare ourselves for the soon coming of the Lord, our God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, the second coming. For he is soon to come. It is imminent that he breaks the sky and he comes back for his people, his people uh, that, that, that know him, his people that, that serve him, that worship him, his people, those that have been pardoned for their sins. It is imminent that he makes his return. Now, I cannot tell you exactly when his return shall be, but I will tell you this, that we know that any moment, uh, according to uh, his, his conversation on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, he said, no man knows the return or when I will return or when when God shall send his son Jesus back to the earth. But, it, 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 but for certain it behooves us, all of us. Um, we cannot be lackadaisical in this hour. We cannot be um, um, uh, found without doing the works. This is the hour now that we ought to step up our game, so to speak. Uh, this is the hour that we ought to step up uh, and be more fervent in our beliefs in the name of Jesus. This is the hour uh, that we are to be prudent, that we are to be solid in the word of God. This is the hour because any day now he may crack the sky and come back for his church. Who is his church? It is his church that are without Blemish, it's all of us, his bride that has no blemish. Well, how can you say that uh, it, it, his bride, his people have no blemish? Because we all have been bought with a price. We all have been bought with a price. And that price was the sacrificial lamb, the blood of Jesus. And so, therefore, we are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. By the, by the, the he was the sacrificial lamb. We are redeemed through and by the blood of Jesus. What is it that can wash our sins away? And the moment that we begin to yield and, and, and submit ourselves to him is the moment that we can uh, come to him 
with a contrite spirit, with a, with, with a sorrowful heart, and ask God, ask Jesus, will you take me from this point? And I think this is the time, because it is inevitable that all of us will die. It is inevitable that, that death, it is certain that death will come. We know not the hour, we know not the time, but it pleases us to be ready. I am reminded today where I want to go. I am reminded of the prophet Jeremiah. Um, I want to talk about the prophet Jeremiah. The prophet Jeremiah, and I want to um, deal with Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, and the 11th verse. And that verse reads, as such, uh, it reads that, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Let me read that one more time. Verse 11, Jeremiah from the book of Jeremiah the prophet. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace. Listen, listen. Thoughts of peace. Not evil. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. And that's where I want to lay my subject, uh, pin my subject off of the second part of that scripture about an expected end. Um, because everything has a time and a season. Everything, it is appointed. It is a time and a season. That everything, I don't care if it's good or bad, has got to come to an end. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So I don't know where you are, what you are dealing with in this hour, but there is an expected end. Now let's look at what, what happens here with the prophet. Jeremiah was also known or called the weeping prophet. He was one of the major prophets of the Hebrew Bible. Jeremiah also authored the book of Lamentation, and uh, it is here in the first chapter of Jeremiah uh, that the prophet Jeremiah was summoned or beckoned by God to become uh, a chosen prophet with the inevitable responsibility. Uh, he was chosen to pronounce God's wrath. God chose him to pronounce his wrath, his judgment upon his people. And we find out that in the book of Jeremiah, the chapter 1, he says, verse 5, he says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. Now listen here. He says, before I formed thee, he's talking to Jeremiah, before I formed thee I, in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth, out of the womb, before you came out of your mother's womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nation. Now listen to that. Let's look at that verse. He says, before I formed thee, the conception of forming thee, God created uh, uh, the infant in his Mother's wound, he's, he's creating him, and he says, before I formed thee in the belly, before, before that happened, I knew thee. So evidently, that was a plan and a purpose that God already had marked for this particular child by the name of Jeremiah. And before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, listen. Before Jeremiah came out of the womb, God said that he had sanctified him. And ordained him 
as a prophet unto the nation. There are many people that are going around now calling themselves prophet and prophetess. And a lot of them haven't been chosen a call. They just picked up the title uh, because it sounds interesting or uh, because it has a highlight. It, 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 is, it, it, it is glamorous. But little do they understand that a prophet is chosen by God. A prophet is ordained by God. A prophet is the mouthpiece of God and the ears of the church. A prophet is one that has been pre predestinated, assigned, divinely assigned to follow the instructions of God and to be his mouthpiece. And there are many in this hour, false prophets. The Bible talks about that in the New Testament. Uh, uh, several scriptures, it talks about false prophets. But, 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 but there are many that are uh, uh, there now proclaiming to be something that they are really not. Just wearing the title. They don't hear from God and neither are they the voice of God. I want to bring clarity to, to this, 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 this office. Now, a prophet has to be ordained by God, sanctioned, sanctified by God, but ordained by God because he holds, he or she holds the uttermost secrets and revelations that God will speak to the church, to his people. A prophet acts out of obedience to the voice of God. They hear God. They, they, they're not always seen. You can't always see a prophet. You're not always going to be able to habitate. You're not always going to be available to, to have commonality with a prophet because they are chosen that makes them distinctively different they are chosen and they are chosen for the divine purpose of what God and how God chooses to use them I can't get no help up in here so there are many that are circulating around speaking stuff and have not heard from God. My question to you, how can you hear from God when you don't have a prayer life? To sup with God, you must have a prayer life. You must be in tune. You must be intertwined to the voice of God. You got to know him and you got to know his voice. So that when God gives instruction or he gives a mandate that your ears are in tune and readily your, your person, your body is readily to act upon the divine instructions of God. So we have in this hour, in this land, many false prophets. But we see here, Jeremiah was summoned by God and chosen by God before he formed him in the belly of his mother's womb. God said, I knew you then. Meaning that there was revelation. He knew he, him then. If, he, if you know a person, there has to be some kind of revelation. There has to be some kind of intertwining. There has to be some type of cold mingling. Well, how can you say that God knew him? God knew him. Because he formed him. He shaped him. And no doubt, spoken 
to him. My question to many of us, has God spoke to you? Are you listening to the right voices? Here in this text, the book of Jeremiah reveals a detailed graphic picture, first of all, of how disobedience leads to destruction. Hallelujah. It reveals how disobedience leads to destruction. And the prophet Jeremiah lives through the experience, the horror of his prediction when Israel refuses to repent. Jeremiah lived through the experience. He saw the foolishness. He saw the wickedness. He saw all of those things that Israel was doing as a nation. But God had used this prophet to warn Israel. And Israel, no doubt, chose not to hear the prophet. And they did not repent. Israel refused to listen to God's instruction and became a stubborn, rebellious people that followed too many of their own selfish desires. Yet even though they breached the terms of their covenant agreement with God, God was still willing to turn from his own wrath upon Israel and bless them if they would have repented. That brings to the, my, my mind, that brings to my mind about the situation here that we're facing in America. The United States of America. The country, the government that has on its slogan of the dollar bill, in God we trust. It makes me think that we are a nation of people that have forsaken God and have gone away from the agreement, the, the, the agreement of the, the covenant agreement. Many of us have backslidden. Many have gone away from the covenant agreement that they had with God. Yeah. The Bible talks about that. They have gone away and, and, and they refuse to repent. A nation that refuses to repent will bring destructions upon itself. Which takes me where I'm going right here. A nation that refuses to repent. Yet there are many preachers like myself. There are prophets. There are teachers. There are evangelists. There are yet a work to be done in this hour. But you really can't find us in this hour that's most needed. What do you mean, preacher? This is the hour of revival, a revival. America needs a revival. America needs to be brought back. They need to come back to God. And I believe that if we would repent as a nation, hear what I'm saying. That's why uh, uh, th there's a need for a revival. The word revival means to revive us again. We need a jump start. And as a nation of people, we need to repent. Repent of our sins. Repent because there's, there's, there's idol worship that's going on among us. We worship more things. We worship more uh, 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 things that, 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 that are temporal we put our minds and our focus on people. And we make God out of people 
that have no power. They can't get you into heaven. So we put our trust in all the wrong stuff. And we begin to serve and we get, begin to worship all of these idols. America is a nation that has fallen away from God. And as a nation, as a people who profess and proclaim God, we need to repent. I am reminded of the scriptures, a particular scripture. When a people have gone away from a breached an agreement between your, your, your covenant agreement between you and your God, when you walk away. When you leave, when you backslide, America is a backslidden nation. So I believe that God will, if he chooses to, that he can change everything that's disorderly, everything that's not of order. He can change it if he chooses to. But listen, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, he said that if my people, who are his people? We, those that are believers, we, those that say we are the redeemed, we, those that say we have a relationship with God. He says, but if my people who are called by my name, Who are called by my name. Those that say you are of me. Those that say that you are of God. If my people who are called by my name. That's the first thing. Second thing. You need to humble yourself. If you would humble yourself. That's the second thing. You need to come into cognizance. You need to recognize. That you are a nation. That we are a people that's out of order. A sinful nation. If my people who are called by my name would. This is. If you would would. If you would. Humble yourselves. Now look at that word there. Humble. It means to, that if you would be broken. Come down from your high minded. Come down. From vanity. Bring. Uh, uh, release that pride. Get delivered from your pride. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, seek my face, pray, and turn from their wicked ways. Word of the Lord says, then will they hear from me. Then will they hear from heaven. And listen to what he says, I will heal their land. So, here we are. Jeremiah. was the prophet that was sent unto Israel that God ordained that he chose. He sent him unto Israel to send them the warning. God instructed him. But Israel, no, lie, no doubt, like America, like we are now, became a stubborn, rebellious people. Isn't that America? They became a stubborn, rebellious people that followed too many desires. Isn't that America? Hmm. The word repent means to f that you're feeling remorse or regret about one's wrongdoing or sin. You turn from whatever the sin is and you don't go back. If you are sorry, if you say, forgive me, God, or if you ask a person to forgive you, and you mean it from your heart, you don't go back and keep doing the same thing over and over. And here we are, a nation. As a whole, I mean, there are, I know that there are some people that are yet praying. And they're praying for a change. They're praying that God's will be done. I know that. Fasting and praying, laboring before God. But it's not enough. I 
And if you are truly sorry, sorry, if you are truly sorrowful for your deeds, if you're truly sorry for what you have done, the sins of this nation, then you don't keep repeating the same thing, America. Justice can only allow evil to go so far. Let me say that again. Justice can only allow evil to be perpetuated. To, it, it only allows evil to go so far. And this nation has become, my God, an evil nation. A nation that perhaps once loved each other, but now we're fighting. So I believe God is sending a message to America to prepare yourself to get yourself in order. So this prophet Jeremiah, so God chose his prophet Jeremiah to give Israel, Israel, southern kingdom of Judah, one more chance. Turn from their wicked ways. Isn't that what I just said? Turn from their wicked ways or be exiled to Babylon. And of course, Israel refused to repent. And because they refused to repent, it was to their demise. And what happened, they were captive. They, were, they became captives, captives. And they were led away to Babylon. And in this 29th chapter, uh, what this really is was a letter to the captives. Here we go. A letter to the captives. The 29th chapter of Jeremiah was a letter to the captives. A letter from Jeremiah to the captives in Babylon. And here we go. It is a letter. A letter, a future, and a hope. But now make no mistake about it. If you don't repent of your sins, then you must suffer the consequences. The church, those of us that are in the church that call ourselves the church, we got to make sure that we're absolutely right and have the right relationship with God. And if you know that there is darkness, here we go, because we got witches in the church. We got all kinds of people, warlock spirits in the church. That call themselves of God, but they're not of God. All they're doing, some of them is hirelings. They don't really have the heart of God. Not the heart of the people. But they entangle and they're, 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 they're embellished by the title itself. And for their own selfish gain. And what needs to happen? The church. Those, some of us, not everybody, needs to be brought back to repentance. This nation, America, needs to be brought back to repentance. And if we don't repent, we'll end up just like Israel. Hallelujah. We'll be overtaken in a war. We'll suffer at the hands of another government or another kingship. And that's what happened here in Israel. After they were led away captive to Babylon. They lost their hope. They lost their dreams, basically. Because they did not have the privilege of doing what they wanted to do in their land. So since they were in another man's land, King Nebuchadnezzar, since they were captive in their land, they had to do as the king said. He had to worship his God. So here was a dis distraught people that didn't repent. And because they didn't repent, it led to their captivity. And this is what sin does. When we don't repent, it leads to us being in bondage, captive to 
whatever it is that got you in that position. It may be drugs. It could be a relationship. It could be a financial barrier. It could be many things that's not of God, not of his will. So, in the text, after so long of a period of being in captive, uh, and some of us have been in captive in our own personal life, bound to things that have us entangled with the yoke of bondage. We become slaves to things and to people that God never intended for us to be entangled with. So we have to suffer the consequences. And the only way that you get free yeah, is by repenting to God, submitting, yielding, God, I'm sorry. God is a merciful God. The great thing about God, his wrath don't always strive. It don't always stay with him. Yeah. And because he is a merciful God, he can bring every one of us that are in bondage, everyone that's in bondage, he can bring you from that place. So Jeremiah writes this letter. This letter is to uh, 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 the people to, the, to his own people that are captive in Babylon. And he writes this letter, the words of the letter, was to all the people that were held captive, to the priests, to the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away and captive from Jerusalem. To Babylon. The letter was addressed to King Nebuchadnezzar. And in that letter, in that letter that was addressed to his people, he said, Make yourself at home with your current situation. May not be like what you wanted to be. But I want you to make yourself at home. That's what he said. Make yourself at home and be good citizen. While you are in captive, be good citizen. While you are in Babylon. Then he instructs, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and sit there and, 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 and eat the fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and daughters and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may increase that yeah, and not diminish. Now pay attention to that, to, that, to that. He says that you may increase while you are there and not diminish. Uh, my brothers and sisters, you may be struggling with issues. You may be bound in a situation. But I'm saying to you to gather your mind and repent. And while you're yet in the situation, wherever it may be, your Babylon, your captivity, make yourself content. That's what he's saying here. Make yourself at peace. Hmm. Then he goes on to say, seek the peace of the city. Be friendly. Seek the peace. You don't thrive in argument with an enemy and they have you captive. How foolish is that? When they have the upper hand of, of, of you and you yet want to run your mouth or argue, you cannot thrive. You cannot be successful. When you are in captivity. So what you are to do. Like he says. Make peace. In the city. Where I have caused you. Listen. 
Make peace in the city where I have caused you to be carried away. This is God talking. Make peace. I caused you to be carried away since you didn't want to repent. You chose not to repent. And this is the punishment. Since you chose not to surrender your will unto God. Since you chose to remain in that darkness. Since you chose to continue in that way. He said, I allowed you to be led away captive to Babylon. And no doubt, there are many of us that are captive today that are in Babylon. We're captive. We're captive to our own calamity. We're captives to our own sins. We're captives. We're slaves to another master when all you had to do was repent. How simple is that? Father, here I am. I stretch my hands to thee. I am yielding my will that your will might be done. So forgive me for what I have done. Forgive me for bringing the calamity on to myself. So God says, make peace of the city and pray to the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And then a particular notation, a particular notation at the, the next verse of the next writing. Listen, he says, do not let your prophets, devineers, your prophets, those that profess to have special power, which is warlocks, do not let them, or even if they're called by God, he says, do not let your prophet or uh, your devineers who are in your midst deceive you. That's what I was talking about at the beginning of the text. Carrying the title and the office of a prophet, but knowing good well that God didn't choose you to deliver a message to anybody. Because a chosen prophet will deliver what thus said the Lord. Whatever God tells him to say, he's going to say it. If it brings about a rebuke, he's going to rebuke. Why? Because it is the will of God. It is the instructions of God to get his people right. So he tells them to seek the peace of the city. But he gets down here and he says, do not let your prophets and diviners, diviners who are in your midst deceive you. Nor listen to your dreams. Don't tell them your dream because they're not real prophets. Don't tell them your dreams because they don't have your best interest. Don't tell them what God has shown unto you. Do not tell them the dreams which I, the Lord God, has caused you to, to, to dream. And he goes on and says, for they prophesy, listen, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. They come in my name. Now let me, let me, let me hang a notation right there, an asterisk, put it right there. Don't you know gifts and callings are without repentance? <laughs> for God says, I have not sent them. Which brings me to the next verse. And he, he admonished, he tells Israel in verse 10, For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be completed, after 70 years be accomplished, at Babylon, after you have endured for 70 years. Now, 70 years is a harsh sentence 
for your sins. Seventy years is a harsh sentence because you chose to be stubborn and rebellious, a stubborn and rebellious nation, America. Seventy years they were captive in Babylon. Verse 10. For thus said the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you. <laughs> when he breaks you, and when you're in a position that you can't look up to nobody else but God, this is what he says. I will visit you and perform my good works towards you. My good work, my good word. I will visit you and perform my good word towards you in causing you to return to that place, this place. And then he goes on, and this is where my scriptural, scriptural text is found. And he says, verse 11, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. Now he's talking to a people that are in captivity through a letter. He says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. I know the thoughts. Now this is, let's translate that. Let's bring it, that into now. What God is really saying to those that are in bondage. What God is really saying to those that are captivated and captive, led away captives in whatever struggles that they are having. What God is really saying. Now that I got your attention, I want you to hear what thus said the Lord. He says, for I know the thoughts. For I know the thoughts that I think towards you. God is telling you that his mind is far more greater than what you, than what you can think of yourself. His mind is so, 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 so much higher than the revelation that you have of yourself. For the devil has imparted your mind and distorted your vision. He has imparted your mind and told you uh, that you are somebody that you are not. But God says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord. And here it is. He said thoughts of peace. God said thoughts of peace. I think peace. I want you to have peace, not calamity. I want you to have order. I want you to be, 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 be in a place of serenity. I want you to be at peace. Now let me put some comma right there. Put a comma right there. Anytime there's confusion and argument and it continues, continues, and continues, it's not of God. That's why I can't understand these people that call themselves prophets and prophetess. You Wear a title and you be of the Lord, but yet and still your life is calamity, it's confusion. And there are many that, that I know, they're always caught off disagreeing, sowing seeds of disagreement, discords, arguing, unnecessarily so. But God, the God of Israel, the God of this nation that we live in, supposedly, God says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, said the Lord. Thoughts of peace. So God does not want you contaminate your, he does not want your mind to be contaminated with an argument that's not of God. That's the devil. But my thoughts for you are thoughts of peace. And here we go. And not of evil. So God don't wish anything evil upon a person, those are witches. Those are warlocks. Those are people that are not of the, the spirit of God that wants to 
cause you harm, that wish evil upon you. This is not God. God don't wish evil upon a person. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you what? An expected end. Now he's talking to the people that are captive in Babylon. I want to bring you peace. Not of evil. I want to bring you thoughts of peace. Not of evil. And to give you an expected end. Now my brothers and sisters, really what the Lord is saying. That is time out. For that place that you are still in. You might have breached the agreement that you and I once had. But really what you are saying is time out. I love you so much. My mercy and my grace would not allow me to continue to be angry with you. So he says that that, 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 that my thoughts are for you to prosper. My thoughts are for you to do well. My thoughts is to bring you from the captivity of every sin and everything that keeps you in bondage. My thoughts is to bring you out of it. And to bring you to an expected end. What is the expected end? It means that there is a future. Hallelujah. And that there is hope. He brings us joy for tomorrow. He brings us uh, joy in our sorrow. He brings us hope for tomorrow. He brings us an expected end. He gives us uh, an increase. He brings us from bondage. But he brings us to a future. And in your future, you don't look like what you're looking like right now. In your future, there is hope. In your future, there is joy. In your future, there is peace. In your future, there is an increase. And what God's saying, I will bring all of your calamity to an expected end. I will bring confusion. I will bring you from confusion. And I will bring you into peace. I will take you from bondage, from being tangled up uh, with the yoke of bondage. I will rescue you from that yoke and bring you to an expected end. The expected end where there is hope. An expected end, hope for tomorrow. An expected end where there is joy. An expected end. Joy in your sorrow and expect it in. I will give you an increase and expect it in. I will replenish your loss and expect it in. I will lift your burdens. Be blessed, my brother.